now we are uh, live. So, uh, Imro, if you could take it from here. Thank you. And I am very pleased today to present the sixth lecture of our Home Forum Architecture Lecture Series Summer 21. In this pilot semester, we present successful and progressive studios, architects, artists, and educators from New York, London, Miami, Boston, Bratislava, and Berlin, which are actively connected to academic research, computational discourse, applied ecological architecture, fashion design, and art fusion, the medium of music. I'm also happy and pleased with our generation of speakers from 50 to 50 percent, which characterize today's changing paradigm of the profession. Today's speaker, architect Lenka Petrakova, is a successful representative of the upcoming Central European generation of architects, and she is the second lecturer after Miroslava Brooks after separate lecture of Dana Chupkova from Carnegie Mellon School of Architecture previous year, who works abroad and does represent a new wave of Central European Czechoslovak architecture. Also, Lenka works in the Zaha studio in London. Her presentation today will not be about practice in a renowned studio, in which, by the way, several great architects from Prague and Bratislava and association with Umprum as Jakub Klaška, Martin Krecha, or Martin Sandner, but because her winning project in an international competition. Thank you, Lenka, for sharing with us your ideas today, and I forward the word to the today's session moderator and my colleague, Jan Kopernetsky. Uh, thank you very much. I will be very brief. You basically said everything that, that uh, I wanted to say. Uh, one more thing that uh, I met Lenka uh, several years ago, uh, maybe already seven or eight years ago, at one of our workshops uh, that we were organizing at that time. And she already was, uh, she was studying at probably three universities at that time, and she kept adding and adding more universities. Uh, but not only that, she was uh, obviously very eager to learn. Uh, but most of all, she was, uh, she was at that time uh, ready to produce world-class architecture. And that's what she is doing now. And that was very obvious uh, back then when I met her. We, um, for this session, we only have uh, 60 minutes. So I will not take uh, more time from, from Lenka's presentation. We will have a very brief uh, Q&A session at the very end. So whoever is watching us on Facebook, please post your questions uh, in the discussion. And uh, whoever is here uh, online on Zoom, uh, get ready um, for your questions so that we use uh, the whole 60 minutes that Lenka can dedicate to us. Uh, thank you, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to, to be here today and to be able to introduce you my project to Eight Continent. And thank you very much, uh, uh, Jan and uh, uh, Imri, for the introduction. I'm very flattered by what you said about me. Um, so uh, to start, I will share with you a short uh, video introduction of the project. Um, can you see the screen again? Yes, all good. So let's play. Okay, so uh, I would like to introduce you to the project Eight Continent uh, from a little bit uh, different side and uh, uh, in a little bit more depth uh, than I usually do. And uh, I will show you today geometry studies. Those were at the beginning of the project and we will introduce you a few of the processes 
I uh, I was trying uh, to implement or I implemented. And what I would like to as well discuss, because as I understand, you guys are mostly working on your studio projects right now, and and maybe um, as well to see this lecture can help you, um, you know, to look at your projects from a different side, or could help you uh, to you know navigate through some challenges. And uh, what what I will show today as well are. Um, you know, some ways I went through but didn't work out. And I think it's absolutely normal and it's actually really good uh, sometimes to be able to say um, that, you know, some uh, uh, some geometry direction is not the best for the project and uh, uh, you should just acknowledge it, learn from it and, you know, step back and, and start a little bit again. So to start, everyone is usually asking me why I I wanted to work on a station in the ocean and uh, why I wanted to, you know, address this issue and why a person from Slovakia that doesn't have a sea is actually interested into the sea. And, um, you know, that's, the answer is pretty obvious. I mean, I was always looking into the nature for inspiration and um, I'm really fascinated by, by all of it that um, the sea is offering um, by you know, the enormous variety of species, those are there, but um, on the other side, the pity is that they're really getting extinct and um, the beautiful bodies of living organisms are being replaced by parts of plastic and plastic pollution and trash in general. And um, I was feeling um, um, really, you know, interested uh, in, in this problem and I wanted to address it as part of my thesis project at the University of Applied Arts in the studio, Hani Rashid. And I wanted to look at this problem and bring uh, a solution from my point of view and, and start a discussion about how we as architects could as well have our say in, uh, you know, how to shape the future as well of the oceans or in general of the ecosystem and uh, what we can bring to the discussion. So I was looking into the ocean for inspiration, as I said, and I really believe that, uh, you know, the ocean is, is really vast space and uh, it is uh, hosting so much different lives and life forms. And uh, they're all really unique, really beautiful and really smart. And, uh, you know, they are able to, to sustain themselves in different conditions. Their bodies are um, not two bodies are, are really the same and they're always answer to the surrounding they have and they're really good in gaining the energy and all the nutrition they need and uh, you know there is something we should still learn from the nature and um, as an architect as well this way of how you know architecture of the living bodies changing towards the conditions maybe it's something that we should not really forget when we are building the buildings. And uh, so um, these are uh, other pictures of, of uh, you know, the, the life that can be uh, found under the sea. And um, it's not just, you know, fishes, but it's as well plants and, and those can really find, uh, uh, find their place and react to the really dynamic surrounding and be able to protect themselves. And um, as well, it's not just what is happening under the water, uh, but as well, all of these plants and all of these living organisms are again really changing once they come to the uh, to the split level between the water and the air and um, uh, they became this beautiful floating organisms on the water and again they they react they find balance and uh, uh, they uh, offer us a large inspiration that can be taken forward Sorry. The other question I'm usually getting is why is it called eight continent? And uh, this one is uh, pretty obvious. Um, so as I knew I wanted to do uh, something uh, with plastic pollution in the oceans, I started to look uh, into uh, know how is the plastic pollution really moving in, inside of the ocean? How is it gathering? How is it affecting the life? And um, I found out that uh, there are many, uh, many plastic particles. Those are gathering uh, thanks to the ocean currents and, uh, and they are creating a large garbage patches. And these garbage patches um, are some of them are already nicknamed. And the large one and the largest one of them is in the North Pacific. And it's nicknamed the eighth continent. 
So the name of this project was uh, actually taken from the location where I wanted to position the station. And uh, when I was looking at the location, I was actually looking at two different um, conditions. So the one was to look at uh, where the current is naturally gathering the trash, but the other one was uh, where is actually the enough um, depth of the seabed and where is the seabed enough stable um, so I'm not getting kind of underwater mountains those could affect the, uh, the movement of my station. This was at the very beginning uh, of the project but I already at the time knew that there would be some part of a station that would go underwater and I needed to address this as well in picking up the location. Just uh, maybe to explain you as well a little bit, um, at the University of Applied Arts um, in the studio, Hani Rashid, uh, we as a TZ students, we could pick uh, freely our brief and our location and the program and, you know, um, make it all um, on our own. So that's why I had all of this flexibility to, um, you know, create the brief uh, considering what I really wanted to achieve with that. So, and uh, when I started to look at the geometries, um, the first ever study I did <laughs> for this project um, was uh, a vector field study, um, because as uh, I was working with the water currents, I thought this is, uh, you know, a kind of uh, a good way how to approach it. And I started to look at the ways how uh, I could have uh, maybe a barrier on the water how the geometry could be created. I was looking at different patterns of, of how maybe I could, you know, I could build this barrier in the water and how it should be rotated to, to gather the most trash. Um, but uh, I found out that this is a very you know, static approach to really dynamic problem. And, and uh, although I did many studies, um, this was you know, one of the ways that uh, I decided that this is not uh, the, the appropriate way how to address the problem and I will show you a video and um, uh, then I started to look at more dynamic animations and actually work with a uh, with a particle animations and try to look at the problem that I would not have just a static barrier within the sea, uh, which would have to be enormous to really be able to do it, but maybe I'm going to have an object which can, uh, you know, react um, to the current and um, uh, which can by its own movement as well gather the particles and navigate them to the sensor. I was uh, looking at it if it should be a stable object or if it should be an object that is really moving and then if it is moving you know from how many barriers it consists and what is the um, and what is the curvature of these barriers to really be the best for uh, navigating the particles towards uh, towards the collecting part pardon sorry And after, uh, you know, I answered uh, for me some questions about uh, what what is going to be the overall strategy, if the object going to be moving, if the object going to be stable, uh, if it is uh, if it is really um, a barrier or with you know some points where the trash can flow through or where it can be collected, or if it is a more uh, dynamic object, I started to work on the geometry studies to actually design um, the piece on its own. And as I was showing you at the beginning, I was interested uh, into the research of the bodies. Um, those are, you know, under the water. But uh, for me, the most important part was not actually how they are shaped from the outside, but um, uh, you know, the idea that these bodies are in the water, but at the same time, the water is flowing through them. And um, uh, it was more about the geometry of the organs on its own. I mean, even if we look at the human body, you know, our organs are able to take from the water and take, uh, you know, from different foods, uh, all necessary uh, to be able to extract the nutrition. And that's why I was as well looking at the geometries more in a way, how could I create the geometry through which the water can float? 
And um, while it is floating through the geometry, uh, it, it can be, you know, maybe filtered. Uh, it can be, uh, um, it can uh, be starting many different processes with the water to address a more complex organism, which could be a self-sustainable on the water. So I started to look at these very dynamic studies and um, you know, look into it, how maybe to create some, some piping between the different pockets, the pockets where the water can be collected and, um, uh, and uh, thinking about if this element uh, gonna have the water like flowing through, like for example, here you see the holes, would, would this be outside on the ocean and the water is just flowing through the holes and something is happening to it or is this object something that can be enclosed and actually the water enters to the inside of the object and then a different processes are happening to it. So it was a very abstract study, but at the same time I understood that for the main part, for the collector uh, of the trash that would then, you know, accelerate all of the other processes in the station, I need to develop a geometry which is really fluid and answering to the, to the dynamic of the water and that um, I will be actually designing a kind of or organ which would be then, uh, you know, as an onion wrapped into the different programs and uh, to the different functions I need for the overall sustainability of the station. So um, to, to, to tell you a bit more about the processes that I was thinking about and that uh, I'm using in the station. So uh, I knew that, you know, the the main source uh, I have on the water, I have on the ocean is the seawater. And I want to take from the seawater and extract the trash, collect the trash. But, um, you know, as well, I gonna gain the filtered water. And, and this is the, the main resource for me, which I can use for accelerating the further processes. So, you know, I knew I gonna return some of the water back to the ocean. Uh, I wanted to use some of the water for the fish tanks so I could get nutrition for people those going to be living on the station and um, I could as well find a way how to desalinate the water and you know start even more processes that we we can know about I mean already from the salty water there is a way how to you know grow algae there is a way how to then gain a, a biofuel from algae that can really help the station as well from the sustainability point of view there are many plants, a halophytic plants, does really like uh, salt water and there is a possibility to grow these in greenhouses. But as well through the process of the desalination on its own, um, I, I could gather minerals and I could as well gain the, the fresh water and then use this fresh water again for planting and new crops, those you know already have the fresh water or you know, to use this fresh water for the crew on its own. And everything what I did uh, after uh, this, this summary or, or this realization of what I want to achieve, which processes I need to have inside of the station to be able to sustain the community I'm going to have on it. Um, you know, all of that was then more program wise development of the brief of the project and was then leading how I was shaping and using the geometries. So I started to look at the possible ways of combining the geometries I was developing and, and look at them from a point of view is like, um, I knew that uh, probably I need a dome for the desalination where the water gonna be evaporated. And um, uh, you know, I need uh, another part where the trash can be collected. And I started with a very simple uh, organic grounds, let's say, um, to, to think about how the forms could be combined, where I need to have them really dense for the water to run through, where I need to have them large and open and airy for the evaporation, and uh, uh, how, uh, you know, the, the, the processes could work in the most natural way possible. So this was one of the first cases, and I'm showing it as well to to actually say that you know there are many ways when when you as a student. I mean, it was my thesis project, so so I was a student. You just do a rush decisions. I mean, for for me, the rush decision was that. Um, I just draw a floor plan <laughs> suddenly into a form which has nothing with a floor 
floor plans. And uh, I understood by it at this point that, uh, you know, I wanted to do something that is coming out of the water and that is coming out of the very dynamic forms. But I wanted to use it because I wanted to have as well the water running through. So I understood that if I want to do this object on the water, it's not everything has to be fluid and not everything has to have the same geometry, but it actually I need to address each of the functions with a different architecture, with a different geometry approach to really suit the function and um, and to be able to to not just create the envelope which needs to have a too much uh, uh, mechanical pieces or too much additions uh, because it just doesn't work as a geometry for its purpose. So I started the long journey of of remodeling these pieces and and modeling a new pieces. Those would be uh, you know more really concerned about the functions and as well for the for the life of of people inside of it. Um, so you know in the in the lower part which was the collector that was still you know suggested to be more fluid and more dynamic the areas where I had the water tanks and uh, uh, and fish tanks it was still with the water it was more fluid but already um, the areas those are extended towards the top those are the greenhouses they were uh, more answering uh, the ideas about uh, planting flowers or the hydroponic uh, cultivation so uh, so you could have area areas where you know pots could be positioned uh, and uh, then as well if you look towards the center I knew that this going to be some kind of a a floating piece so I would need something like a navigation tower for the people I would need a circulation center uh, how they can go through these different parts and uh, uh, it had to be something more more static and uh, uh, and more developed uh, in accordance to um, to the needs uh, of of the people those inhabited you can actually see it in this section even a little bit more and uh, if we look as well at the uh, at the top part, uh, so um, so the kind of the flower heads, those are you know encapsulating the greenhouses. Uh, these got again a very different language, which is much more fragmented and and not so fluid. And this was uh, actually uh, because I wanted um, that they are used for the condensation of the water and to be able to have a different. Um, uh, different cavities to really gather the condensation. It was the best to, to be able to navigate the water through some parts. So I was creating this uh, to you know, to allow uh, the water condensation on one side and on the other side, the, the heads, uh, they have um, a very subtle uh, piece, which is really large and, and which should remain new on the sails of the water uh, because the part of the movement of the station was that with the movement of the station, the trash is gathered. So I needed a natural answer to, um, to progress with this. So then when we go more inside of uh, what is actually in the, uh, in the eighth continent, uh, you can see that there are many various uh, different program units and each of these units has a very a different language. Um, so on one side is it really the the water pots and, and the inside of the collector uh, which is uh, really fluid and and then we have the head of the flowers and uh, those are there for you know the pots for plants we have the communication areas uh, but we have as well the research and education center which is wrapping around and the, the water uh, uh, the water tanks to be able to be uh, in really a close proximity to the medium it is studying we have as well uh, the public domain uh, which consists of the areas where the people are uh, actually living and uh, as well there are support facilities or, or underwater viewing towers and this is all uh, together you know matching the ship skill and stabilizing the station um, uh, to be able to withstand a different water conditions. As I was saying, I was trying to do something what uh, what can sustain itself. So it was uh, very in, important for me as well to uh, 
work on one side with the water processes, but on the other side, uh, think about how can I really gain energy. Um, so one of the main sources of the energy for the station is the uh, is the tidal uh, is the tidal energy which I am uh, gaining through the barriers. Those are on one side, you know, navigating the trash, but on the other side, really gathering uh, this wave energy. Uh, then I have um, uh, solar panels. Those are on the top of the water, uh, of the greenhouses, and uh, they are allowing you now energy to be gathered uh, to heat up the water tanks for the water evaporation. And then, yeah, there are other possibilities how to get energy, for example, from the algae. And just if I show you still the inside of the greenhouses, so these are the walls that I was talking about. And for example, the geometry, how they are uh, designed and, and the pots, how they are imagined, was that there can be a, a rail for a robot to go between them and be able to you know, gather the plants, water them, uh, or plant them on their own. And the, the station was really made uh, in, in people in mind so that, you know, people, visitors, researchers, technicians, they can all go and visit. And that's why it was really important for me as well to work on a, on a scale, uh, on a human scale and, you know, introduce ways uh, how people can enter, walk around, access it by boat and, and look at it not just from the big, uh, big, um, big idea, uh, but um, you know, make it more realistic and and learn from it how how the design um, can you know uh, approach uh, different uses. And I will show you uh, just one different project as well um, uh, now. And this is the project I did actually before my thesis. It's uh, called Arcantica, and. Um, uh, I just want to show it because it has a very similar creative process uh, in a way of starting with an abstract geometry, which is based on the full idea of the project, but then uh, looking at the scale of the units and recreating them to, uh, to allow the function uh, to take the dominance. So in this project, I was looking at the and a different growth pattern because my topic was the time given and it was a bioprospecting station in Antarctica. And as I knew that the station is going to be except, uh, encapsulating many seeds and it's going to be looking for seeds, uh, I thought it's a, it's a natural inspiration uh, to, to start with a geometry uh, of them and uh, with a geometry from really natural world. And on the other hand, I was looking into recursive patterns um, on one hand, yes, because uh, because of the plants, but on the other hand, as well, because of Antarctica and maybe, you know, the first idea that crossed your mind was in Antarctica, there is a snow. So uh, I was looking at the, at the crystallic structures from a different point of view. And uh, I was trying to, to find out how to use these geometries in creating a, a shape that could host um, you know, on one hand, an uh, arc, a seed arc, archive, on the other hand, something that can really float around um, the, the continent and that can, uh, you, you know, gather all the seeds and react to the changes those are happening. Uh, because there are large changes in the in the weather conditions in Antarctica. Uh, so the continent is much larger in the winter when it's frozen and it's shrinking towards the, uh, the summer. Uh, so with the station I was developing, I wanted to address this change and design a station uh, that could have uh, a different uh, different uh, stages throughout the year. And uh, in the in the geometry area, I started with the uh, with the really abstract studies, and then I went uh, into looking at them uh, from the more technical point of view again, and uh, I used the tool of the uh, of the generative forms as an inspiration to do some of them um, uh, in a more detailed way by modeling themselves on my own, and uh, and I started to then combine this uh, this geometric unit um, with. Uh, with the form I had in mind, and uh, I wanted to make a form which can be actually split to to different units. Those could go around uh, Antarctica, and and those could collect the biomaterial. And then when it's 
a winter time they could come together and use uh, actually the opportunity of being encapsulated in the snow and in the ice and, and use this as a stabilizing point and create a one building together uh, at the very end. So in this project, I was looking, uh, you know, at the geometries in a similar way, like one by one and and trying from my abstract studies, create uh, something that, uh, you know, has its own uh, answers to the program. And um, I understood already the time that, you know, from the outside, there are different conditions on the geometry. It has to be able to float. It has to be more like a, a boat hull. Uh, and from the exterior, it can be as well more covered and more unified. And actually the richness of the forms are more dominant in the interiors. And I actually revisit this project as well a few years later after I did it at the university. And, um, and I was, uh, you know, thinking even more that uh, uh, there might be a possibility to, to actually wrap it from the uh, exterior uh, to larger extent and to be able to really protect all of these precious pieces of the geometry and, and these areas, those can be inhabited in a different way and, and to protect them with more, you know, more unified uh, geometry uh, that is answering more towards the exterior and there is the split between what is inside and what is outside as you can find in the human bodies in the nature. So thank you very much. That was kind of the overview of, of my two projects that I wanted to share with you. And those are taking the inspiration from the nature, but they are not forgetting uh, about, um, uh, you know, answering to the pro program, uh, technology and the architectural challenges that we have. Thank you very much. Um... So now is the time that uh, we've got like 15 minutes maybe left for uh, a Q&A session. Uh, I would like to, to invite uh, everybody, our students from uh, Studio Architecture 3 at UMPROM in Prague to, to ask any questions. I'm also checking the Facebook stream if there are any questions. And let's, uh, let's start with, uh, with the debate. Maybe let me start with the uh, initial question. According, according the studio, you graduate with uh, under Hani Rashid in the younger one thing, then you move to the another studio as as um, Zara Hadid, which was not in that time in the younger one uh, when you studied there. So you moved to the another younger one uh, famous star architect then. So you are very, very close and following the roots of the Angevante. What does it mean, Vienna and uh, the Angevante for you? I, I really enjoy the university. And um, I think three years for a master program are just the right amount. And that and many people are saying that it's a little bit too long and uh, they, they don't want to even take on the course. But I think as a as an architect and as a designer, it's really important to have um, a more time to be to be able to you know develop one's own design language and be able to to form one's own um, you know opinion about architecture and what you want to achieve. Uh, so I believe that's why Angevante is a really amazing university because it's giving the students the creative freedom to you know address issues they are close to and it's as well giving them opportunity to work in a large teams what is not so common in, in many universities and uh, it's really uh, you know teaching uh, it's uh, really teaching each of the students that the teamwork is something really crucial for the for the architectural field and once you really work in the practice you really have to be able to work in a team and it's it's never just about you but uh, it's about the full team and about the project, um, first and foremost. Right, so the, the message from you to nowadays students in the uh, university is how to deal with architecture, to work on teams and to be ambitious and to pursue us, or yourself as far as fast possible, isn't it? Yes. You, you summarize it well. It's a 
suppose Dan wants to ask the next question. Uh, I don't know. Uh, not yet. Sorry. All right. So uh, let me continue then. Uh, still, I would like to invite everybody to, to put together uh, questions, comments, and, and maybe start a debate. Um, in your project, mainly the ones that you are showing, it, it, it's obvious that the computational approach is, uh, is uh, a natural thing for you, but it's not uh, the core thing for, for architecture uh, that you produce. And that's something that uh, we need to remind ourselves all the time that uh, this might be a very um, helpful tool, but sometimes it's not enough uh, as, the, as the main motivation. So could you maybe elaborate on, on that? And not only, not only the computation, but uh, also uh, the aesthetics, the, uh, any aspect of, um, of the architectural creation that enters your, uh, your process. How do you how do you perceive these, and what are the main and crucial aspects of um, of the of, of the of the piece of, of the of the building of the architecture that you are creating? How do you yeah. think about the parts? As as you said, uh, you know, com computation it is a big part of the architecture today. It's a big part of of the process um, I, I do and the way how I design. Uh, but uh, I believe sometimes we really get lost in the process. And uh, we need to really, uh, you know, find the right way how to use all the tools we have to not have the design driven by the tools, but have the design driven by the architectural needs and, and by, oh, you know, um, the response to the environment and what we want to achieve. So this is how I approach it. Um, I, I usually start, uh, you know, with a more abstract uh, studies with something that it's coming from a computation or is coming from from the nature but i'm looking at these forms uh more for inspiration and uh, i'm then starting to develop them uh, as an answer to all of the other aspects that i need to get into and uh, you know maybe it is possible to do all in a computational way but uh, i believe um, you, you you really need to as an architect as well be able to uh, uh, to have your own judgment and implement it into the designs you do. And uh, that is what is making it unique because otherwise anyone with any similar script could do the same thing. But it's unique because of how you feed it with the data and with the information and, and what do you think is really the most necessary uh, in that case. And uh, we should never forget that architecture is about creating architectural spaces and it's about engaging people and creating for them something what is there to stay and uh, that can, uh, you know, really change maybe the, the surrounding that they live in or the way how they see the world, how they see the architecture, how they approach um, the, the buildings. And um, we sometimes forget actually that uh, you know our main focus are people and and not creation of crazy forms. Somebody wants to say something. Well, let me just continue with my with my thinking about your position as a young architect in an international office and your previous study experience in the Angevante, for instance. And when I look to your project uh, you showed us today and also your practice uh, in the renowned uh, architecture practice worldwide, um, a, a very famous one, uh, I don't think there is a difference between your education and what you're doing now, but many people are saying that this is something very academic and then it is not very appropriate for, for, for your close future, where to go, what to do. As an architect, it's very difficult to make living money uh, out of that. So, so you are a very lucky person that you are able to continue with uh, with your interest and to apply your interest to uh, in uh, such an office. And but I think, do you trust to your future that you can be alone and to continue with your way of architecture in a close future? I hope so. And uh, uh, yeah. I 
I see what you're saying, but on the other hand, uh, you know, I have, uh, in my personal case, um, I have as well a technical background. And um, I, I believe uh, that as well when we do uh, architecture, which is challenging and, uh, you know, maybe is looking for someone too academic, um, that we are able to implement into it the, the technical nuances and we are really able to make it for people understandable and readable and explain it in a way. And if we are not able to do it, then, you know, it can stay as a sketch, but there is no difference um, if it is, you know, a, a really a complex form or if it is actually a cube that no one can explain why is it the, the right answer for a certain conditions. So uh, I think there is no difference uh, if, if you are an architect in a really technical school or uh, in a really academic school, if, if you can't, uh, you know, fight uh, for the reasoning of your designs, then if from any of the schools, you are not really going to find uh, um, a reasonable position in the world. Maybe from the technical one, you would be able to, you know, use your, your skill in any different, in some different way. But uh, that's the same from the academic one. I mean, you always have a choice. But um, we just need to be, you know, cautious that uh, we, we need to be able to explain what are um, the, the processes and um, uh, uh, what are the, um, the rules that brought us to the designs and it can be the craziest design ever. But if it is really answering um, the, the environmental uh, needs and the needs of humans and the needs of technology at that point in time, um, then it is probably what is making sense. And we should not just judge it uh, because we don't understand it. Right. Is there a big gap between your your study time and your practicing time? Big gap in uh, what sense you mean? In, uh, in, in a way, how to create the, the architecture. How did you create architecture in the academy and then how you do your architecture in the Hagik architect. So if it is, if there is a difference. I think the difference is uh, about the team. I mean, I know when you are in the practice, uh, you work in large teams, so the responsibilities are split. But, but also in a drawing of architecture, also preparing the, the, the schemes and technical issues and also about the fabrication, the thinking about the production of the architecture, which is less, less thought in the university and then is reality in the, in the real office. So, but I think it's a big difference between the academic life and the practicing life. I think there is definitely some sort of difference uh, because uh, in, you know, in the Hadid um, uh, or in, you know, any practice when you are about to build a building, the one of the first things you are thinking about is really how you fabricate it, and um, uh, and you know it doesn't need to be you know just uh, um, the all well known ways of fabrication. It can be you know as I'm using a new technology, but you're gonna think about it as well first and foremost. And that's uh, what in academia is many times not really coming into account, or or it's uh, coming there in very late stage. Um, so. This is something what is interesting how as well the ways of fabrication are then shaping your design uh, in the future steps. And uh, um, yeah, formal wise, um, there might be a, some sort of difference, uh, but uh, at, at the practice I work for, we're always looking uh, for a new ways how to solve problems and new ways how to design spaces for people. And um, so, it is uh, still challenging to really be able to look outside of the box. And I think that is the common with the university that as well as a student, you are always just trying to look for new ways how to approach the problematic you are given. Maybe the last question from my side is that your, your Zahagi experience, the big office doing the, the biggest project around the world. And then can you imagine to apply that ideas and get uh, international practice to very uh, local 
scale of Central Europe to uh, to implement such a, such a, um, an architecture by way of uh, way of research in the real architecture practice to our our our, our local uh, architecture work. Um, yeah, there are as well, you know, different projects that uh, Zaha the architects did in Europe. So um, there is, of course, a possibility to work as well in, in this environment, in this scale. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's not just about the architects, but it's as well about the investors, I think. Uh, you know, we architects, we, we as well have to buy our projects answer to the needs of the investors and uh, and maybe the needs in the Europe are currently a bit different. Uh, maybe the risk um, that the investors want to take is lower than the risk in China uh, because of I don't know, the length of uh, how uh, how long it's going to take to to the construction, um, the materials, the way really how is it fabricated, and um, it's it's not just about the architects. Um, you know, sometimes people think that you know, oh, architects just do crazy stuff, and it's just about us what we want to do, where we want to do it, and um, we are just free to do anything we wish. And it's just our problem that sometimes we do it wrongly, and sometimes we do it in the right way, but. Uh, Something is frozen. I think we we lost the connection on on Lenka's side. So. Yeah, you know, architects are answer. I can hear you. Uh, but we could we couldn't hear you. But uh, okay. most of, I was most just, of, yeah. yeah, I was just saying that uh, you know uh, we are not uh, alone responsible for everything. It's uh, it's as well. Uh, the way what the society, what the culture, and what the investors need, and uh, and many times, uh, you know, we need to as well change our visions to um, to be able to find a way together. Because some conservative uh, uh, architects and thinkers uh, saying that okay, just fine for China and those remote landscapes over somewhere over there. But we have to protect the government landscape, and we don't allow to uh, to, to damage our countryside with uh, such a such a, a bold forms, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, uh, I'm just saying that as as a, as a as a one of the argument, which don't allow the international. Uh, uh, thinkers to get to our uh, our region. So thank you for your response, Anka. Thank you. Yeah, you know, the problem is that architecture, although we are really trying to integrate, uh, uh, you know, all of all of the aspects that we have at the end of the day, how is it perceived is, is very subjective. And, uh, you know, some people really like it, some people really don't like it. But, uh, you know, as with anything, with politics or anything, uh, you just can't make it right for everyone. Right. I will, one more time. Yeah, Chao wants to uh, ask a question. Uh, yes. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, interesting project. And uh, I have a question is that uh, uh, in the process of studying uh, geometry, and how do you find a balance between uh, uh, your interesting geometry and your functional purpose? Um, do you have some experience to share with us about this aspect? Thank you. Uh, you know, it always depends. And there are just hours and hours of modeling. And there is no other answer, you know, in academic world or in real life. It's uh, you, you really have to look at the form and judge for yourself if you believe, uh, you know, the form can be developed farther or not. And uh, you have to try. Um, you, you, you have to try if it can answer to the program response to the technical issues, how you can adjust it. And you need to be aware of what you actually need from the form to do. And uh, and then you, you have to try, maybe you have to try with many different forms. And, uh, and maybe you have to think about the technology, not just about, you know, I have some piece which I need to plug into, but uh, about the system, which is uh, 
which you are need to, uh, which you are trying to answer to, and and try to maybe change the system a bit and change the geometry a bit, and and just throughout the process, um, find the right geometry that works for you and works for your project. Thank you very much. Anyone else would like to? Otherwise, I'm going to ask you something. Okay, so it's my turn then. Um, as I mentioned, you studied at uh, really many universities and you graduated most of them. Uh, and I know that you are very positive about uh, the things that you do and, and um, that you always, always find the good uh, side of uh, everything around. Uh, although sometimes I'm uh, sometimes I, I'm a bit more critical about uh, things that, than you are, but let's uh, let's take very positive. And my question would be: Can we somehow summarize um, all the universities that you attended and find one uh, positive, good, important thing that you have learned? Um, and what was the moment when you realized that this is this is the thing that this uh, this institute can give uh, and and be beneficial for, for yourself. I, I graduated all that uh, I had the program to graduate from. <laughs> so I just didn't graduate the ones I was for exchange programs. So right. just to make it clear. I, I was studying at some uh, institutes where I, I haven't graduated because of reasons, but yeah, you, you did, <laughs> you did graduate, yeah. Uh, so um, I started my uh, architecture and the wars in Slovakia and I did um, a bachelor degree at the civil engineering faculty, the Slovakian University. And what was the one crucial thing that you've learned there? And the one crucial thing was, uh, uh, was it was not actually one, it was so many technical details that I learned about. Uh, I had uh, really amazing uh, professors from the practice. Those are building houses and, and uh, residential buildings and we were at the time, that was our main focus. And uh, I learned a lot about, you know, construction systems, about materials, about, you know, the way how to, you know, position steel in your concrete and uh, how to, uh, you know, position pipes and, uh, you know, all of the really practical stuff that um, is maybe for someone not so interesting, but at the end of the day, that is as well what is now allowing me to, without the problem, talk to many consultants on any project. Um, you know, fire egress, you know, something what no one wants to talk about. And it's like one of the most crucial things in, in high rise buildings. And you're going to spend hours and hours developing the system for the fire egress. Uh, so it was really the, the, the technical knowledge I gained from the, um, uh, civil engineering faculty and then um, I did both bachelor and the engineer at the faculty of architecture and um, I really enjoyed it uh, and uh, it was uh, you know more about the design that the civil engineering in fact and uh, I, I had uh, really good professors those were giving me the freedom to try with the forms and uh, you know first time approach more uh, uh, more experimental our way of designing and um, and I probably would not be where I am without them if I wouldn't have the freedom to do it. Um, at the university um, at Angevante, as I said, uh, uh, you know, uh, it was a three years program. It was a lot of creative freedom, but it was as well a lot of about discussions uh, about the forms, about the geometries, how to approach them, how to use them, how to integrate them. Uh, and uh, it wasn't not only about discussions with the professors, but uh, between the students. And this is what I really as well like about the university. And I haven't seen in uh, such an extent in any other um, then, you know, we were at the, at the studio day and night and uh, we were discussing our projects and we were supporting each other uh, as a team and it's something really important that a student uh, uh, really needs to, uh, you know, be aware and have the constant feedback. At the uh, SciArc in, in uh, LA, um, there was a very different university. It was a very different uh, than what we are experiencing in Europe at least the studio I was in. And, uh, you know, till in Europe, you get your brief and then 
you mostly work alone or even in a team, but it's like it's your way you run, you develop it uh, as, as you believe uh, should be developed. But in America, it's about the studio and it's about the topic that the professor wants to develop and the way how he wants to approach it and how he wants to develop it. And uh, this really high individualism that we are used to in Europe was not so appreciated. And uh, that was for me a large surprise and a very different way of how to design and uh, how to approach the studio. But but it was really interesting and, uh, you know, to really see at the end what is really the power of the team when they have a one common goal and when they're all working in, uh, you know, uh, in the same limits. At the Technical University in Vienna, um, there my courses were mainly based on the urban planning. So it was again something what, uh, uh, what I didn't experience before in such a uh, such an extent, and we had there one really interesting stu studio which was led um, in a way of peer to peer. So the two tours uh, wanted the students to arrange their project on their own, and it was a large group of I think twenty two students. So it was a very large group for peer to peer, and uh, to be self organized without any leadership. And uh, it was interesting to, uh, you know, for us to see uh, what can happen as well as well for them to see that uh, uh, there is something that is academic and maybe works in an academic way or works in, a, in a smaller groups. But um, we at the end developed a, a nice project all together and, and learned a lot from it. Uh, but it was uh, more interesting from the side of the kind of the social experiment. Thank you, Lenka. Uh, that was your one hour that you uh, could dedicate to us. We are very lucky that we had you. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing uh, your thoughts and experience and hope that you uh, had a great time with us as well. Thank you very much for, for having me. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and I hope your students uh, you know, uh, can get something out of this lecture and, and I hope they enjoyed it. Good luck for all your uh, future endeavors in architecture and beyond. Thank you very much. So still have a good day and a very productive studio work. Thank you, Lenka. Thanks to everybody joining us today. And I have to announce that we have two more lectures. On Thursday, we have Edward Keel from Summer Hutton, London. And then the last uh, lecture will be on Monday in a week by Gilles Retzin. So we are looking forward for for those two lecture meetings. So goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a nice day.